Hi, and welcome to Socratic Studios. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science-related with the best minds in the field. My name is Vishnu, and today's topic will be ball lightning, mysterious glowing orbs that may just come from a different dimension. With me today, I have Dr. Andrea Aiello of the Max Planck Institute of the Study of Light. Because of the fact that he witnessed one when he was a teenager, ball lightning has become an area of great interest to him, and he is beginning to develop his own ideas on the matter. Welcome, Dr. Aiello. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. Um, so a bolt of lightning is a very common sight, but lightning in the form of a ball is very rare, and there have only been a handful of these events recorded throughout history. You are one of the lucky few to have witnessed such a ball lightning event. Can you tell us about this experience? Yes. So, uh, first of all, uh, um, there are different kinds of ball lightnings. Uh, basically, there are um, two main uh, categories. One, that, uh, one kind of ball lightnings that have uh, strong physical effects. Uh, say, even on the observer, some people even died in the past uh, being hit by a ball lightning and sometimes uh, smell or uh, sounds. And then there is a second kind of uh, ball lightning, like the one I witnessed, uh, which are just a, a manifestation of pure light without any sound, without any smell, without any heat, and so on. And actually, this uh, second kind of ball lightning is uh, so um, weak interacting with everything that some people even doubt that they are real uh, um, phenomena. There are also some hypotheses about the fact that in, uh, when there is a strong uh, thunderstorm with a strong uh, ordinary lightning, some intense magnetic fields can be created. And uh, it is known that uh, the effect of magnetic field on the human brain can uh, generate uh, hallucination. And uh, some hallucination are uh, similar to, to what is reported as a ball lightning. However, uh, in my case, I can ex exclude, exclude that there was an hallucination because uh, we were in two, two, two persons me and my sister, and we observe exactly the same phenomenon uh, simultaneously uh, with the same characteristics. So the probability that it was uh, the same hallucination to two different people is, uh, is quite low, I would say. So I'm pretty sure of what, uh, what I saw. So uh, I tell you the scenario. Uh, it was in the beginning of the 80s. I was a teenager. And I was in my room in Ladispoli, which is a small village on the beach close to Rome, some 50 kilometers north uh, to Rome, and uh, there was a thunderstorm. To be honest, I don't remember if it was a winter or uh, perhaps it was a spring uh, thunderstorm. I, I think it was a spring because I remember there was a sunlight and uh, often we have this uh, thunderstorm uh, with the sky not completely covered by clouds so with a lot of sunlight. So there was uh, this uh, thunderstorm outside and uh, I was uh, with my sister in uh, my room. My room was a bit particular because uh, it was uh, basically, uh, there were not external walls, uh, there were uh, glass uh, windows uh, from almost from the ground to the top, uh, covering a huge surface and I was uh, with an uh, aluminum frame, which is aluminum is very good uh, conductor. And uh, we were uh, playing uh, also with uh, a conductor ca cable, so it was an electric cable, unplugged of course, and then we were using a like, uh, uh, I don't know, like, uh, like this, uh, doing uh, things like this. And then uh, suddenly, in front of us, uh, at about, I don't know, one meter something from the ground, appeared uh, this uh, ball, more or less uh, this uh, size, uh, size of uh, football, uh, football, uh, European football, soccer, I think uh, you call it. Uh, a football uh, ball and uh, bright uh, color uh, uh, yellow uh, with some nuance orange I would say and uh, slightly vibrating uh, like uh, I mean not some, something like a solid object more like a, 
not even a, like a flame because the flame is a change of strongly shape. This was clearly a ball with some, say, some ripples on the surface, and they fluctuate in the air a, a few seconds and then disappear without any other effect, without the noise, without uh, heating, heat, without uh, sounds, nothing, just this uh, light uh, manifestation of light and then they disappear. According to some people, we were quite lucky because uh, perhaps, I mean, we were quite close, a couple of meters, but perhaps if uh, we were closer, say one meter, we could have uh, risked our life. But uh, honestly, I don't know, because there was no consequence of any object in the room uh, or um, any smell, anything strange, but it was there. It was not that it was there. <laughs> so, um... Ball lightning remains a mysterious phenomenon and accounts of it throughout history vary in their details. Nevertheless, can you give us like a brief overview on its basic uh, characteristics? Well, again, uh, there are not basic characteristics in the sense that uh, according to the different observer, uh, there are different phenomenologies. That is, uh, there are uh, these uh, ball of light which can uh, variate from, say, a few centimeters diameter to up to one meter. And there are some cases where this uh, uh, ball lightning move quickly, entering even a chimney, passing in a room, uh, destroying object, and then flying away. Or uh, in the case, like in my case, just floating quietly in the air and then disappearing. Other people even get uh, uh, horribly burned by, by this uh, ball lightning, like an ordinary lightning. So there is not a typical phenomenon. There are many uh, uh, varieties and probably, uh, although the similar uh, appearance, so a ball of light, uh, they are generated by different physical phenomena. Uh, so there is not, uh, not uh, a unique explanation. The characteristic, uh, the, the, more, the common characteristic of ball lightnings is that uh, they are mysterious. <laughs> but uh, that's the point. I mean, even Murray Gelman, the great uh, physicist, the inventor of the quark, uh, in, he wrote a beautiful book, the, the Quark and the Jaguar. Um, you, you should read it if you don't know this book. And uh, it's a popular science book. And in a chapter, he touched upon the, the point of ball lightning. And um, he clearly said that, uh, you know, there are uh, phenomena which are uh, mysterious uh, just because uh, people make them mysterious because they are fake, like, I don't know, Geist uh, or uh, some uh, telecinetic uh, uh, happening and so on. While there are, uh, and these are 99% fakes, uh, while there are other phenomena which are mysterious, like ball lightning, but just because they are rare, so very difficult to, very difficult to, to spot. And ball lightnings are exactly this kind of phenomenon. It's extremely difficult to make a research about them because we don't know the origin, so we don't know how to generate them, and we don't know when they are naturally generated, under which conditions, so we don't know even know where to look for. So, for example, the case of the Chinese uh, article uh, you, you sent me, the 2014 article, they were extremely lucky because they were uh, observing, uh, uh, they were doing some spectroscopic measurements of, of ordinary lightning, and then uh, suddenly appeared this uh, uh, ball lightning moving uh, horizontally. So it was really a, a lucky shot for them. But, and they were in some condition which are considered uh, quite typical for a ball lightning, that is, uh, there was a thunderstorm, there were ordinary lightning, and they were quite uh, above the, the, uh, the sea level. They were above uh, a thousand meters or even more. Well, if for, a, for example, in my case, uh, my ball lightning, it was uh, totally at sea level. I mean, my home was uh, 100 meters far from the sea, so from the beach, and uh, we were at sea level, so that was another characteristic that uh, made it uh, quite, uh, quite strange. So unfortunately, there, there is not a, a common casistic for, uh, for, this, uh, for this phenomena. 
if you go through through a bit of literature, or even if you just go to Wikipedia, which actually is a good source, you find many different, uh, many different uh, cases. Got it. Um, so you, you, you mentioned some, but what are some of the most widely uh, accepted theories on what wall lightning is and how it's created? Okay, well, uh, there are several theories, but I wouldn't call accepted <laughs> because again, I mean, the, the, when you have a the, to have a theory, you need to relate, uh, to connect uh, the, the theoretical prediction to uh, some experimental facts. The problem with the ball lightnings is that we don't have experimental facts. So the theories are more uh, a hypothesis rather than theories. However, there are basically two main line of research. Uh, Research. One uh, is about the intel internal energy source, uh, and the other is the so called the external uh, energy source. So, the external energy source is uh, the old uh, explanation for ball lightning that uh, dates back uh, to, to Piotr Kapitska, Kapitska, a great uh, Russian physicist. And uh, in this uh, kind of explanation, basically, the energy is, su is uh, supplied like in an ordinary lightning. Uh, by uh, very intense uh, electrostatic field generated by uh, an unbalance of charge between the clouds and the, and the ground. Because, uh, I mean, the, the, the planet Earth as a system is electrically neutral, but not because the ground is neutral and the atmosphere is neutral, but because the ground is uh, slightly negatively charged and the, uh, and the atmosphere is a slightly positive charge. And the connection between these two conducting the system is given by ordinary lightning, which happen a thousand of time every day across, uh, across the world. So they are really like an electric cable uh, connecting the, these two different, uh, different potential. Consider that the, above the surface of the Earth, there is a constant electrostatic field, which with a value of about 100 volt per meter. So this means that uh, if you, between your hand, if you put it to one meter of distance, if you could measure, there is about 100 volts um, difference. Of course, you cannot measure because uh, you are part of it, so uh, you should be isolated external to, to measure it. So this kind of theory, they, the so-called external energy, they say that, um, okay, the phenomenon could be generated by the supply of energy given by ordinary lightning, uh, which is basically due to the fact that uh, there are electrons uh, and these electrons get uh, separated, but initially they belong to molecules of water, for example, and they get separated from the, from the, from the nuclei by an intense electric field. Consider that you need an electric field of at least say, one million volt per meter or even more. And then uh, they create a so-called plasma. Plasma is just a gas of uh, ionized uh, matter. And then uh, this uh, is high energetic, they accelerate, and then they finally hit again other particle of dust or water again, and they re reconnect again to the nuclei. And losing energy, they emit the light. This is a, so basically the explanation of ordinary lighting, although it's a much more complex phenomenon. The other class of theories said that the called the internal energy theory, that is, they suppose that there are some, uh, for example, silica particles, which can be emitted from a, a piece of glass, a piece of stone. I mean, the silica is a, uh, very common in, uh, in the ground. So when a, a lightning hit the ground, make exploding some particle of silica, and some of them have a particular mass, a particular charge that they can go quite far and start to, uh, to supply energy to, to the atmosphere around, making this a ball, uh, ball lightning. There is a nice uh, article, uh, experimental work uh, made by some Brazilian uh, um, researchers, uh, which is cited by the, the Chinese article, and they make some videos where uh, they just uh, create some electric discharge on some silica, and then uh, you can see there are the ordinary sparks uh, you have in, in this case. Also, from time to time, a little ball started to move and go away. And this is just the glow 
of light that, that follow one of these uh, nanoparticles of silica, which are, has been ejected by the substrate by this electric uh, discharge. So these are the so-called internal energy theory, because uh, you have uh, something uh, with made by matter, and this has a strong energy, and this uh, move uh, and emit energy in form of radiant light. So there are basically these two class of theories, but again, you cannot call any of them really an accepted theory because they're both reasonable, but both unproved and unprovable until we are not able to have a systematic observation of ball lightnings. Okay. Um, so I think you mentioned this uh, twice before now, but in 2014, the the group of Chinese scientists published uh, some of the first real data on ball lightning, and this data came from the the emission spectrum of a specific ball lightning event. So, what is an emission spectrum? How do you capture it in the case of ball lightning, and what does it reveal about the phenomenon? Okay, they, as I said, they had a very lucky shot because they were just observing ordinary lightning. And then before their eyes, it was created this ball lightning. So what kind of measurements they were doing? They were doing a spectroscopic measurement. What are spectroscopic measurements? Well, light, as it came from the sun, for example, we call it white light. We call it white because it is made by basically all the colors of the rainbow. In fact, uh, this is an experiment that they certainly did. If you take a glass prism and then you take uh, heat by some light, and then you will see that uh, behind the prism is formed uh, a rainbow with the seven color of the, uh, of the spectrum. So this series of colors is the so-called spectrum of visible light because uh, light is a, an electromagnetic phenomenon, so it's a wave which has a, a wavelength, and to each wavelength is associated the one color. So the, the wavelength of light are very small, are of the order of a nanometer. One nanometer is a 10 minus nine meters. So the, the visible spectrum of light goes more or less between the 400 nanometer, which are the, the, the violet colors, to 700 plus nanometer which are uh, red and then afterwards, after the worst, so there is the, the, the infrared. So light uh, is a wave uh, phenomenon made by several wavelengths. And the, 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 full, so the collection of wavelengths of a light signal is called the spectrum of the signal, OK? Sometimes instead of wavelength, people talk about the frequency. And the frequency is uh, just uh, uh, a conversion, uh, the wavelength converted via the, the, the speed of light. That is, the frequency is uh, in terms of beating per second, tan, 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 tan. Well, the wavelength measure really the, the, uh, the length of a full oscillation of, of light. So, are two just two different measurements of the, of the same stuff. And uh, a, spect a spectrometer is uh, just an instrument which separate the a light signal in its colors. So for example, a prism is the simplest, is the simplest uh, spectrometer. Actually, uh, there are different models of spectrometers. Some work with the so-called diffraction gratings. A diffraction grating is basically a surface with some uh, edges, a CD-ROM. If you take a CD-ROM and then you watch the, 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 the record at the side against the light, you will see some rainbow. Is because there are many scratches on the surface and this uh, uh, produces this uh, spectrum. Uh, other spectrometer contain indeed the prism inside, which uh, separate the several component colors. So to each color, there will be an intensity, and you record basically the intensity of the light according to the, to the wavelength. Why this is useful? Because, uh, for example, this was, uh, the use of spectrometers was uh, fundamentally important in astronomy because you use them to understand the, the material a star, for example, is made. Because a star emits light, visible light, and by observing the, the spectrum of this light, you can you know what are the elements inside these lights. Because each material, say sodium, uh, 
nitrogen, uh, oxygen, and so on, as a typical emis emission spectrum. So each material, uh, each element uh, at its fingerprint uh, given by as a very particular spectrum. So if observing the spectrum of uh, a LED signal and then you find some specific lines corresponding to the emission line of uh, a given element, then uh, you know that uh, inside, uh, say, you know that this uh, uh, light signal was created by some matter contain, containing, for example, sodium, uh, nitrogen, or whatever, uh, any other gas. So the spectroscopic analysis of, um, of a light signal uh, give you information about uh, the elements present uh, in the process of formation of the light. So for example, this uh, Chinese is so there was abundance of nitrogen, which is the most of course, the most uh, um, common uh, gas in the, in the atmosphere, but there was also some uh, uh, iron um, and other, uh, and other uh, particles. But again, since it was uh, just a one shot observation, uh, just a one lucky shot observation, uh, there are not other spectra, other experimental results confirming this kind of spectrum, unfortunately. Uh Okay, yeah. Um, so there have been many experiments uh, throughout the years which have tried to recreate this ball lightning effect. Um, I would like to focus on one which was done in the place where you work at the Max Planck Institute. Mm -hmm. So essentially, if I understand correctly, what they did was they, they just discharged a high voltage capacitor uh, in a tank of water. Um, so can you sort of explain this experiment and sort of what it revealed about the phenomenon? Okay, uh, you, what you said is uh, correct about what they did. Uh, what is not correct is that uh, it was done in the place where I work because uh, Max Planck Society is a, a very big society in Germany and also not only in Germany. And uh, uh, it's just the central organization. Then uh, associated with this central organization, there are many Max Planck institutes. Actually, there are uh, between Germany and the rest of the world about 82 uh, Max Planck institutes. And each institute is uh, completely separated by the others. So the experiment you are referring about was done initially in Berlin, but that was East Germany in that time. And then that group moved to uh, Max Planck uh, um, Institute for Quantum Optics, uh, which is in uh, Garching, uh, nearby München. And that is a uh, one Max Planck Institute. The Max Planck Institute where I work uh, is instead a different one, is a Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light, uh, and uh, is located in Erlangen, about uh, 200 kilometers from, far from, uh, from Garching. So I, I didn't work uh, uh, on that uh, project uh, and I don't work in that institute. I work uh, still uh, within the Max Planck Society, but in a completely different uh, institute. However, I know this, uh, this, uh, this experiment. And uh, if you see also the videos, actually the last article is still on pre in press. It will be pu published uh, very soon. If you see this uh, video, you, you see this uh, kind of uh, glow, uh, then a mushroom-like typical of uh, uh, explosion in, uh, in, in atmosphere, like uh, also atomic bomb, uh, this is kind of so-called mushroom cloud, this is typical of any explosion of this kind of in the atmosphere, and then it disappears. So also the author themselves uh, say clearly that uh, the phenomenon they observe uh, is very different from what is uh, usually uh, called ball lightning. For example, a nice uh, trial they did was uh, to put a piece of paper on top of the water tank to see if the ball lightning could cross this uh, or barn or do whatever. Instead, it was just a bounce off and went down because uh, uh, what is the physics of their phenomenon? So as you said, there is a tank of water containing about 10 liters of water. And then there are two electrodes, uh, flat uh, copper electrodes and then uh, filament electrodes. And then uh, a strong, uh, some kilovolt uh, of um, potential difference uh, is given. Then what happened? Well, water uh, is H2O, the, the molecule. is a particular molecule because it's so-called a dipolar molecule. It is um, as a strong dipole moment. Dipole moment means that uh, you can imagine this molecule like a, a little rod with uh, one side positively charged and the other negatively charged. 
So if you apply a strong electric field, one part of the charge are attracted, the other are repelled, so the, the, the molecule tend to, to break and to free the electrons. So these mini explosions of, uh, of electron created this, uh, again, a plasma, uh, so ionized gas, which is a, uh, really like a flame, so as energy goes out and then start to lose energy by irradiation, and this is the phenomenon on the ball that you see, and then uh, eventually all the, uh, all the energy is lost. And uh, why this uh, plasma does, didn't uh, uh, burn or did anything to the, uh, to the paper? Well, because the plasma is very hot inside, but uh, outside there is a kind of, uh, let, let's call it a, a cold film, and this uh, cold film is uh, what, uh, even, even if you put your hand, you don't get burned actually, because the external part of the flame, uh, plasma flame is quite cold, and then uh, this uh, just uh, gets extincted. This is pretty different from an ordinary flame instead, where if you put your hand, <laughs> you get uh, uh, you get burn. So it's simply just a, a water a electric discharging water, and this polarizes the, the molecules. So they lose electron, and you create this plasma. Nothing more than this. But again, as they themselves they say, uh, they also don't believe that this is what. Uh, what is called the ball lightning is a quite different observation. Okay, um, I have a quick question. So did they go into that experiment trying to recreate ball lightning or were they doing something else and by accident a ball lightning type effect arose? No, uh, I don't know to be honest the original history of these experiments. I know that uh, the, the people who started them in Berlin in the time in East Germany they were trying to recreate a ball lightning, but they were in, the, in an institute for plasma physics. And the research on plasma has its interest in its own. For example, the, the dream of controlled thermonuclear processes, so basically the, the, the clean energy, uh, is modern technology based on plasma. Uh, so there is a big line of research on plasma in general across the world. So they were active in this research and I know someone thought to, to reproduce this ball lightning, but I don't think it was the main goal. But to be honest, I don't, I don't know what was going on in that time in Berlin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, so I wanted to really quickly come back to your own experience. Um, mm -hmm. I read in the New Scientist article that you didn't see the, the light inside the ball lightning as moving. It was, it's, it, it was still, but mm -hmm. um, if I know my physics, uh, <laughs> according to relativity, light must uh, remain in like a perpetual state of motion, right? Because it's massless. Yeah. Uh, so what, what's your explanation for what you saw? Yeah, well, the, as I said to the journalists in, um, uh, in New Scientist, uh, I gave a, a, a description, not an explanation. A description is very different from an explanation. I make you an example. Uh, when uh, Kepler make, um, formulated these uh, laws about the orbit of the planets, they were based on the observation of the planets, but they had no idea why the, the planets follow that orbits. He just gave a, a description of the orbits. It was only Newton who developed calculus and understood the gravity. And they could find a question that explained why the planets move according to this, uh, this orbit. So Newton gave an explanation, while Kepler gave a description. So it's very different. It's like in physics, uh, the difference between kinematics and dynam dynamics. In kinematics, you just describe the motion of objects. The dynamics, uh, you use the force, you know the force acting on the, motion, on the object to describe their motion. So my description of the phenomenon was just the simplest possible. That is, uh, if uh, light, uh, as uh, you correctly said, is something that, uh, uh, if you think of light in terms of quantum mechanics, so made of photons, and photons are uh, so-called ultra-relativistic particles, that is, they are massless, so they don't have a rest frame, they are always moving at the speed of light indeed. Then uh, the, the fact that you see light standing, uh, we, yeah, it is very, it's very strange, if in, even not counterintuitive. So my simple, simplest description was just a geometrical. 
that is, uh, and it is based on the on well-known analogy used in the general relativity. That is, uh, if you take a, a cylinder uh, in our, uh, uh, for example, your pencil, and then you cut this cylinder by half, what is the cross section of the cylinder? Just a, a circle, okay? So you, you just get a, a disc. If you have a cylinder, not in our three-dimensional world, but in a four-dimensional world, and you cut by a three-dimensional hyperplane, so our reality, what is the cross-section of this cylinder? It's just a sphere, okay? So imagine that there is a ball lightning between clouds and the heft, in a five dimensional, five means four spatial dimensional, one temporal dimension uh, world. And uh, suppose that our uh, three, three plus one dimensional world is just a, a section of this uh, five dimensional universe. Then uh, the manifestation of an ordinary lightning in a five dimensional universe in our four dimensional universe would be just exactly this uh, that is a sphere of light. Uh, that uh, don't, doesn't move, just uh, can have a slightly, slight uh, um, fluctuation, and then disappear when the, the, the ball light, the, the or ordinary lightning five dimension uh, goes away. Uh, of course, uh, is this a science fiction or not? Partially science fiction, well, it's science fiction in the part uh, written in the, in the New Scientist where the, the journalists uh, suggest that uh, a wormhole could uh, provide for the mechanism. I never talk about a wormhole with that journalist. That was just his, uh, uh, his idea. Uh, and this is a science fiction part. Uh, the the, the most, more grounded part is that uh, uh, theory of electromagnetism in a fair dimension is, um, is very old. Actually, it was developed already in the 30s of last century by Kaluz and Klein. And it is also quite well, uh, well grounded. That is, uh, we know that our um, electromagnetism, so the, the, the one regulated by Maxwell equation in, in, our, uh, in, in our world, can be seen as uh, uh, deriving from uh, say generalized Maxwell equation, this, this is so-called the Kaluza-Klein equation, in a five-dimensional world. So in principle, uh, it's not totally science fiction. You can uh, interpret uh, electromagnetic phenomena in our world as a projection of uh, electromagnetic phenomena in the biggest uh, uh, universe. Where, uh, where, are the, where, where is this missing dimension? Why we don't observe this missing dimension? Honestly, I have no idea. Again, this is just the simplest geometric description. Again, description, not explanation on how, is, how light could stand still. The idea is that, no, light doesn't stand still, light move, but the direction of motion is in the fifth dimension, which you cannot observe. What you observe is only the cross-section of this fifth dimension with our world, and this cross-section is a standing still uh, sphere. Ball lightning is still extremely enigmatic, um, and like you mentioned before, I think in one of the first questions, uh, many people aren't sure whether or not it's like a, a real occurrence in nature. How would you respond to people with such concerns? Well, uh, in the, since we, we have records of, um, um, of this phenomena, there was a collection of about uh, say 2,000 observations of this phenomena in a, in a few centuries. And, uh, you know, in the past, it was not even, um, of course, it was uh, uh, more rare uh, to, to, to witness this phenomenon that in modern time where everybody has a mobile phone and so on. And still, even in now, in modern time, uh, people usually don't have the time to catch a mobile phone. Um, so the fact that an event is rare doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's simply very difficult to, to, to observe. To be honest, if I didn't observe myself, I would also be skeptical about the existence. But since I could see with my eyes, and especially I was not alone, so it was not an hallucination of 
mine. So then I know this uh, phenomenon exists, I know they're interesting, I know they're mysterious, and I have uh, no idea <laughs> what they are. <laughs> that concludes this episode of Socratic Studios. Huge thanks to Dr. Aiello for participating, and huge thanks to you for watching. If you like this, be sure to subscribe so you never miss another video. And see you next time.